You are tuning into the Lehigh Low Ego High Impact Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Volkan Emre, along with a dynamic team of Kellogg School of Management alums. We are here on a shared mission to uncover the mindset that drives impact and success. On Lehigh, we have talked provoking conversations with incredibly successful entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors from around the globe. We uncover the mindset that drives them, allowing them to make a high impact without losing themselves to ego. Now, let's get started with today's episode. In this episode, we are hosting Julia Ellis, a problem solver who shines when it comes to tricky business and legal challenges. Julia's background is a mix of law, marketing and politics, which gives her a unique view on how to get things done. She has helped new tech companies grow into many areas won a big award from Harvard for improving government services and found clever ways to help states pay their bills faster. Julia is known for thinking ahead and spotting potential issues before they become real problems. What sets her apart is her can-do attitude instead of listing reasons why something can't be done. She figures out how to make it happen. In our chat with Julia, we will explore how she creates solutions that work for everyone, even when dealing with complicated rules and laws. Join us to hear how Julia Ellis is making positive changes in the worlds of technology and finance with her innovative approach. Julia is a distinguished alum of Kellogg School of Management's Executive MBA program, where she was a Drake Scholar focusing on cultivating next generation of leaders who are committed to advancing issues and topics related to women in business at Kellogg. Julia has a JD from Chicago Kent College of Law and BA in Economics from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. We are recording this podcast remotely. I am in St. Paul, Minnesota, and Julia is in New York City. Julia, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. It's, it's really great to host you. I've been really looking forward to this. Um, thanks again for your time. And thank uh, you for having me. Absolutely. So uh, I hope New York has been uh, treating you well. It is a fantastic city. Nice. There's no complaints, although I certainly love Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a part of that will that will always be home. And, mm-hmm. and certainly now Evanston as well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So uh, you know, the podcast, we have this uh, standard warm-up questions. I'm really curious to hear your answers. If you're ready, I will fire away some warm-up questions. Fire away. Okay. Coffee or tea? So I, um, I'm i going to like give a, a very political answer and say both. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> there is no such thing as bad caffeine uh, in my mind. I see. So, um, uh, so. I'll, I'll take both. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I think you may be the first person who actually gave, uh, gave the gave this answer. Interesting. Okay. Dogs or cats? Uh, dogs. Okay. Um, I have a I have a rescue. Um, so her name is Madam Dottie Diamonds. Oh, she's very <laughs> okay. she's very fancy. Um, and I've had her for about ten years. Oh wow. Um, okay. Yeah. So my heart will. My heart is with with dogs after my uh, rescue experience. Yeah, I have one rescue too. So uh, it's amazing. Ten years and counting. That's great. Text is your. Or, oh, I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, dog? my my yeah, a dog. Yes, yes. Mine is a Tibetan terrier, um, and I really love him. Yeah, I hope you guys like meet at some point. <laughs> so, I look forward to that. <laughs> yeah, you should come to um, the Twin Cities then. So, text or call. Oh, text for sure. Even if you're going to call me, text me to tell you you're going to call me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, music or podcast? So um, music to relax for sure. Um, part of what I do for a living is is staying very on top of the media environment 
And so um, podcasts are incredibly useful for that because you can really dive into a subject and, and sort of hear people um, in a less scripted um, environment. But if I'm if I'm just hanging out, uh, absolutely music. Okay. PC or Mac? <laughs> There's a sensitive subject. Uh, I have a Mac. Okay. Um, drive or fly? Ooh. I'm going to go with flying because you can get further. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, what's worse, dishes or laundry? Oh, dishes for sure. <laughs> like dishes, they're, they're like dirty and, and like laundry's only a little bit dirty, but dishes are, are always really dirty. Okay. Um, for reference, I will say most of the people so far, like say laundry and you are really? a member of the, yes, you are a member of the minority, but my sample size is maybe like 30, um, but laundry has been so far like a bigger problem for most of the um interesting yes um yeah. like laundry smells great though like when it comes out and oh, products it's amazing right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um what's the first app you open up in the morning the news so oh, me too um <laughs> yeah 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 so um and i i try to like i try to hit sort of like um, the full spectrum. So I like to see what's happening um, across the country and then in, in various outlets uh, and then across sort of ideological spectrum as well. Um, again, the idea being like the widest vantage point, the mm -hmm. better. 360 view on what's going on. Yeah. Yes. Try to so, think horizontal. Horizontal. Um, What's the first app you open up in the morning was the question. And I'm moving on to the next one. What is something that truly makes you happy? Um, so I love dancing. I do it badly, but that does not matter. Um, absolutely love that and hiking. Great. Really great. Um, can we start, like, can you start by giving our listeners a brief introduction to your background and your career journey so far? Sure. So um, uh, my background, I, uh, as you mentioned in the intro, I am an attorney, but I'm a, a very specific kind of attorney. Um, I do work in the legislative realm, um, public policy, um, also in spaces around uh, public opinion and public affairs. So anything that happens, I kind of call it anything that happens um, where you have to ride the great white shark of public opinion, that is, that is my space. And a little bit of background on how I got into it. I, I suppose it was a calling. You know, I remember being... Um, uh, 11 years old and at my seventh grade, um, parent teacher conference. Um, and my, my teacher produced two of my school reports. Um, one was on, uh, my advice to the U S government that we needed to invest in nuclear energy. Um, the other was a policy paper strongly advocating for the legalization of cannabis. Uh, I, the first went over well. Uh, the second did not go over nearly as well with my parents uh, back in 1992. But I'd like to say that, uh, you know, it's it's 20, 30 years later, and at least I'm somewhat vindicated. Well, that's really interesting. I have a question in this about this question. Have you considered journalism at some point? So, um not so like I interact with the press. That's absolutely part of what happens in this space. Um, I have never personally um, been of the journalistic mind in in part because my job is to be um, an advocate. 
and it, or at least where journalism started, um, opinions and advocacy weren't weren't initially um, really part of of the schema. That has changed, and so I think that you see a lot of young people who are interested in having an impact, who are interested in doing advocacy in these journalism or pseudo journalism spaces, like um, you know influencers. Um, podcasters. Uh, Those things didn't exist when I was coming up, but it's, again, you know, it was my preference for, for being an advocate that, that made that choice for me. And at this day and age, so you can actually take initiative and start your own podcast and try to do like this individual journalism or like it's variations uh, if you want, like when you want, and maybe one day, you may absolutely (laughs) i've had several people ask me if if i would please uh start a an ongoing podcast i don't know you know i don't spend a lot of time in uh in front of the camera that's that's normally for my clients uh but again you know i have an open mind to everything that's my just advice to the world yeah one day um we may pull you to the beautiful world of podcasting you um, never know. <laughs> uh, I always ask this question, and I really like this question a lot. Uh, and I'm curious, um, sli- can you name a sliding door moment in your career that changed the trajectory of your professional journey? Um, absolutely. So so I came into this world... Um, well, let, let's say that there's actually probably two. One would have been in law school. Uh, I had a professor who came to me and said, you know, Julia, I think that you're more interested in writing law than you are in practicing in a traditional sense. And I said, oh, okay, this is a solid point, right? I I very much like to think about where we should be going in the future. Uh, So that was sort of one. And it sort of, it directed me more towards the legis... I I came out of law school and started working for the legislature. The second one was about three or four years into my career. And I was with a... um, I was working for the government and, and working for an elected official where we had a public affairs crisis. And in that period or in that moment, I realized that I did not have the kind of um, time and space to have in really in-depth conversations with the people who were in this particular instance um, somewhat upset with us. And so it was in that moment that I learned how to speak in what I call seven second sound bites. Um, so how do you communicate with a audience where they're thinking about a bazillion things that are happening in their day-to-day life. You need to get a message across to them very concisely, um, very effectively, and you need to do it. The average the average adult in the United States has the attention span, <laughs> seven-second attention span. So that, that was a transition away from like amicus briefs and into, all right, I need to communicate directly with the people. So this is actually... Um, you you framed a, a very big problem and challenge that for everybody, um, and I would say mostly probably not mostly but also for maybe not mostly but especially for people in these like leadership positions in any corporate setting or like any institutional setting, and it sounds like by developing this skill set as a lawyer. To be able to communicate in second seconds, second sec, seven seconds and less or less, is that does also mean overcoming a very important like, challenge. Um, so I would say professionally in, in, and personally, maybe right. Oh, abs- so absolutely right. Um, holding people's attention is <laughs> is always a challenge. I would say that the the lawyering part helped me develop um, a better public policy and sort of very thoughtful background um, and and helped me start to think like five, six, seven steps ahead. It was really in the crisis communications world 
which I landed in just, I, I didn't anticipate it. I just landed there and it was clear that somebody needed to uh, take some initiative. Um, that's where I, I started to think more in these seven second sound bites. And I always tell people, if you have a very complicated um, if you have a very complicated subject that you need to communicate very quickly and very effectively, trying to tie it into an existing narrative, something that we all can relate to, um, is a really effective way of doing that. So, so if you, for example, tying something into a David and Goliath narrative is a very effective way of communicating a big and complicated subject matter and concept in one sentence. Actually, uh, Julia, I remember you um, winning a competition like during our journey like at Kellogg. Like it, it was actually an event that I like helped to put together and you were one of the, um, I would say people who ran for like a top three spot in a startup pitch competition. And there I realized when I was watch watching your pitch, like you, you may be also a kind of an show and tell person because you really use like the most how can i say easy to digest very straightforward like images and even like sound like in that presentation i think now actually in hindsight i'm after hearing like you and your answer for my question so i now realize in kind of hindsight how important this communication piece like for you actually is because there um you were talking about an idea, actually, but yet, like, your communication skills actually made you one of the top three, like, winners of that very competitive, I would say, pitch competition. So thanks for, for sharing. Um, I don't yes, know. What, what do you uh, think about this show and tell aspect? I think you also have an emphasis on that, too, when it comes to your communication style. Absolutely. So um, the I think that there that as you think about being as a leader and a thought leader um, in your space, um, one of the things that's incumbent upon us is to, to really contemplate how to effectively communicate and do it quickly. Um, I think it's hard to invest too much time or too much thought in that um, because it because we live in a world of an information overload. And so to be respectful of your audience, making sure that you are delivering and doing so directly and effectively, it is, it's just respect. I want to transition from here. It's a great point to transition into mindset, the topic of mindset, which is also one of the key questions I always, I always ask to my, like, um, yes, actually, the name of the podcast is like Lehigh Mindset. Um, what is your mindset? Like, how would you describe like your mindset? So um, I would say, first of all, I'm an optimist. We'll just leave it at that. But uh, one of my favorite sayings is um, from Eisenhower. And it's, uh, if you if you can't solve a problem, expand it. So if you can't solve a problem, if, if you're looking at something, you're like, I am just absolutely stuck. Um, can you take off the blinders? Can you can you um, expand your perspective and view of the problem to to put together a strategic um, plan that that maybe is outside of what you initially were looking at, but in the greater context makes a lot of sense. That's great. Um, great example too. Um, from here, let's talk about Kellogg and Kellogg Impact uh, a little bit, like on your life. I was very fortunate, like, to have met you, like, during my Kellogg experience. Like many other, like, guests, I I am privileged to have had, like, on this on this podcast. So, um, the impact of Kellogg, like, and what actually prompted you to pursue your executive MBA at, at Kellogg School of Management? Maybe start with that. What prompted you to pursue the executive MBA and what the Kellogg impact has been so far um, for you, both per professionally and maybe personally as well? 
So what what prompted me um, to to look at any kind of MBA is that I noticed that there was uh, there was a gap. Um, I felt like in working with my private sector clients and having come out of the public sector, that there were these were two critically important stakeholder groups that were not talking in the same language. And I think that if you see a gap in a place where a bridge should be built, that it it's okay. that is your calling. That is the door that is open to you to go build that bridge. And so I went to um, I went to Kellogg and and to get my MBA specifically so that I could have um, more intelligent, more informed um, conversations with the with the private sector about some of these problems or challenges or opportunities that felt, I think, a little bit um, outside of the scope of what the the average uh, CSU was dealing with on the day to day. And C suites with it, the Kellogg actually opens everyone like doors of members of like C suite at different like businesses or of different businesses uh, in in multiple different industries. Like you have the opportunity to sit in the classroom like with the people who are almost like running the world. Like for all, I will say <laughs> running the show of like I will say. Um, different aspects of, of, of the, the capitalist, like I will say, um, ecosystem in, in the U S and beyond. So with so that, I, yeah, go, go sorry. I, say, I would say, I, I would say that, um, what Kellogg presents is an opportunity to think horizontally. Um, the, the breadth of, of viewpoints is, um, is, uh, it's unprecedented. It's mm-hmm. a, it's a, you don't get that in any other setting and it allows for, uh, it allows for creative and complex problem solving, uh, above and beyond what we could do without exposure to each other. Excellent, uh, explanation. Thank you very much. Really. Um, like from here, I want to talk about like one content, which I think kind of ignited initiated like this conversation right at this time and we spoke about the Kellogg we spoke about like the business world we spoke about like um like so far um your personal and professional like journey and we are at a very exciting like time period right now we are literally in the um last phase of the election like cycle and there are a lot of business leaders like myself um who are kind of struggling, struggling, struggling in terms of like, um, what does this actually all like mean um, when it comes to to business? Um, it, it is hard to describe, but business yeah. and politics, how, how does like, it trans- how does it like translate, and what are the boundaries and as leaders, like in, in, I will say in in business, like what are the things like we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing, like in a time period like that, especially, and maybe in a broader sense, when it comes to talking about like politics uh, in in general, I know it's like very vague, but uh, I want to use the opportunity of like having you on the podcast to like hear your opinion about and advice like on this very particular topic for, for business leaders. Yeah, I appreciate that. So um, there's a reason that we're having this conversation here on on um, Lehigh as opposed to Politico. So the objective is to talk through how um, how I think that business leaders can sort of feel that there is some tension. I think it's hard to be at this point in time. We're about two weeks out from a presidential election and not sort of sense the tension and wonder, okay, is there possibly some turbulence in my future? Um, and, and then, then the next obvious question is how, how do I deal with that? So we're not here to like talk about polls. Uh, we're, we're very specifically here to talk through how you can think about, 
uh, the political landscape and what is happening. I, I call it more of a social, um, economic, political landscape of uh, what's happening and how it relates to you um, and the the key stakeholders in your business. I will feel. I, I feel like everyone in in business, especially the leaders who are in decision making and team management like situations. They don't have a framework, like they really don't have a framework. And then I think we all are like somewhat, we are lacking in performing a root cause, like analysis to understand like what's going on and what it means like for, for us, like in, in, in general. So, um, yeah, so I think that, so let's start with like, so when we talk about the, the political landscape or when we think about like what we're seeing in terms of um of voters um what what people are out you know out expressing their opinions we have to th remember that these people are there are employees um they are our customers um they may be participating in groups that affect um local governments in the places where where we have um businesses set up or, or corporate headquarters uh and so so remembering that is really important and and i think it's also important from a business leader perspective to recognize that at this particular moment in time um, people are really activated. So we are seeing we are seeing um, participation in uh, political participation in this in the presidential election at nearly seventy percent of all eligible voters. We haven't seen that level of participation or that level of 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 engagement since nineteen hundred. So this is this is a time where it it behooves us to sort of reflect on w what's happening, um, how we got here and, and why, and, and what it means for us. Um, I'll pause right there and see if I, you know, if I'm answering your question, if not, I, I'm certainly happy to sort of dive into what I think may have caused some of this, this very activated, um, uh, st some of these activated stances in the public. So a lot of information to digest, like for me here, maybe I selfishly start like with <laughs> these participation rate, 70% being high, uh, in Turkey, the lowest participation rate I remember is 85% in the, his, in the history that I know of, like, um, that's interesting. And to me, the more, the better. And actually I'm happy to hear that we are in a cycle in which participation is going to be high. Um, like, so I think the, the inter, so the. One of the things that that's worth um, reflecting on is that this the participation, which, by the way, I don't think anyone is complaining about, right? I think that seeing an active and engaged uh, constituency is is something that we should aspire to. Uh, what's interesting is that we have seen engagement tick up ever since about about two thousand, and it corresponds with. Um, things that have been happening in the economy um, and happening to like happening, happening economically and, and sort of socially uh, where I think people are responding to this sense of um, uncertainty. It, 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 you know, we sort of, it ties very closely back to, you know, 2008 when, we started experiencing um, a lot of turbulence in um, in the banking system. Um, we started, so, you know, that carried over. Uh, we've seen some of that turbulence in, um, that has manifested it itself, I think, in, in sort of this populist uh, view or this populist um, uh, movement where you're seeing, um, folks who are, are wage earners, but maybe don't have money invested in the stock market, feeling, um, very insecure about 
their place and their future. Um, so this goes the, the, and there's some tension there, I think, when we also reflect on who, you know, who this podcast uh, will most likely be, um, the listeners of this podcast who, who have come from uh, a background where, you know, we have a lot of experience with finance. We spend a lot of time in uh, metropolitan areas. Um, there's certainly a global bent to our this listener base. And so it's important to understand how that may, like that perspective may differ from people who have had a very, um, a very different experience over the last, so, say, 10 or 15 years where they may not feel um, particularly secure. And I think that as we reflect on, you know, how, how as a business leader, um, can we best approach it? I think the first and foremost place to start, and this is going to be very Kellogg, um, is to say with empathy. Um, and that as we, you know, if we take away some of our, uh, our le take away the lens um, and the, I don't want to call it an insular experience, but if we take away our, our sort of educational lens and our, our finance lens, and we just put ourselves in the position of, of our, the average person working in a warehouse, uh, that helps us to start to understand how our perspectives may differ and how we can have better conversations with people across the, across the spectrum. And in this like spectrum, um, there are two possible outcomes, right, of that like federal elections. Even though I understand like there are very different like layers of like politics in the U.S., I personally really enjoy like the local level politics. Like, and actually, to me, um, coming from like a parliamentary democracy system, and one of the reasons like why participation is so high like in Turkey is like you have an election once in every five years. So and a lot of uncertainty and like and um, crazy stuff is going on within that like time period and people <laughs> want to go and then cast their votes like to have a say. But fortunately here, like in the US, like you have a very different like ways like to basically show your um response like to to the decision makers like on the on the public decision makers uh, yeah, I mean, yeah truly well, I, so oh, i'm sorry Can sorry I i've been truly, truly enjoying like these like local politics it's just fantastic like the idea of like going in and voting for like whether we are going to get a traffic light or not like <laughs> next block it's just like a fantastic thing and i think it works like very well and i've been really enjoying it and it's regardless of like where i lived so far and i lived in many many different addresses like including washington dc like so far but in the federal elections it definitely has a very different like wipe uh i came here in 2013 uh, i could follow the 2012 elections like in istanbul and then since then, like 2012, 16, 20, uh, and now like 24, federal elections have a very different vibe because there are potential, like two different potential outcomes, right? It's a good thing and not a good thing at the same time. I wish that we could have like more choices. I kind of feel that the gray area in between is kind of like diminishing a little bit. Um, but the question is this, like there are two potential outcomes like here. And what is your analysis, like in general, um, what these outcomes like can like look like for um, for the business leaders? And then, what do you think that they may, what type of situations like they may end up like with? I know it's a very broad question. I know that it changes like from state to state. Uh, there are very blue states, which. Yeah, and there are very I mean, red states as well. Like, what is your opinion on that? Sorry if I like cut you off, but two different outcomes, and in this scenario analysis, like, what are your talks about um, as an advice, like, for business leaders for two potential like outcomes in these elections? Sure. So I think one thing to contemplate, um, it, it, I think that we have we do see a uh, a level of polarization that is. Um, higher, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not, 
completely unprecedented if you go back 100 or 150 years, obviously. Um, but you are seeing a, a higher level of sort of tension or stress on the system, um, and that and that works its way into all sorts of uh, our our lives in all sorts of places, including in business. Um, one of the things I think that has happened is that there's um, there's been an there's been some systemic changes to redistricting where uh, where a lot of the purple districts that used to exist have gone away and we have ruby red and like navy blue. And so um, our various constituencies out there are, are not hearing sort of the centrist viewpoints. I always kind of say like it's there isn't always an adult in the room and um, as a, as someone who, who, if you're a business leader, I think you can look at that. Um, and I will get to your question, by the way, about, um, what will happen depending on one of these two outcomes at the presidential level. But I think as a business leader, when you think about the fact that, um, that people have not had these authority figures that sort of sit in centrist positions, um, and that, that they feel very, that things feel very topsy turvy, that's being that is a space to engage with your customers authentically, your employees authentically, um, and that the reception to an authentic conversation to having um, an adult in the room is well received because people crave it. They crave it given sort of just the the like rocking that what they currently are feeling. Uh, as to what could happen, you know, we're about two weeks away from a presidential election. Um, at least for casting the ballots, it's going to be a, a ways away until we know what the outcome is. Um, you know, a couple of things that that are really critical to ne- recognize. One is that both sides of the political spectrum here, whether um, it's you know the Republican side or the Democratic side, at certain points in the very recent history, um, both sides have felt pretty confident that they were going to win. And um, so if you sort of, as someone who does spend some time looking at the polls, um, this is this is going to be very, very close. Um, it's, it's even possible that we could see another situation where we have um, a, a split between the popular vote and the electoral college. Um, so I think point number one is that we should anticipate that one side or the other is going to feel um, very disappointed and perhaps a little bit angry. So I would expect, I would plan for and think about um, the fact that there could be some flare-ups um, on the, if you know, if we say see a, a, a Harris victory, um, there's been a lot of messaging from um, the the Trump campaign that uh, this election is is the the victory margin is too big to rig, and so if you're thinking about what happens if Harris wins, there's an embedded message in there that does sort of harken back to January sixth. Um, and this notion that uh, that that the election could only be won by Harris if um, if there is some kind of malevolent behavior. Now that is that's not true. How would I think about that as someone from a business perspective? If that is the outcome, I think you should anticipate, or you can anticipate um, that. About 50% of the population will feel um, a loss or even deeper uh, sense of of um, distrust in institutions. Businesses are institutions. And so making sure to, uh, to contemplate that and address that population um, with higher transparency will be really important considering I think that the the trust levels have are, are already diminished. If you flip it and you look at the other side again, 
um, it's, it's kind of critically important to remember that that both sides both sides have it thought that, that they were going to win, right? So um, I think that the conversation, if you see a Trump victory, um, the boomerang effect would, will probably be around gender. So uh, there have been some pretty in-depth conversations um, with with um, both in the polling um, and in you know uh, as, as people have dug down around this con around what is happening um, with female leadership and how much trust there is in female leadership. Um, that. That is something that I think we can could see bubble up into a corporate setting. Um, another thing that is there to be aware of is that there's this, there's massive divergence right now in um, young people, and so we're seeing we're seeing a, about a we're seeing seventeen. Well, okay, how do I want to put that? There's about a forty percent difference between how men and women are engaging around Harris. And you're seeing women engage very, very, very positively with her. And men are, really haven't changed much. Um, but this divergence in, the, in this 18 to 29 year old group does say something about, about young people and what their expectations are of society. And it's pretty clear that, that young women have some um, some differing expectations about the world that they engage in. And, um, that could also clearly translate into, you know, if I were a marketer, I'd be looking at that very carefully as I'm thinking through, uh, my, my marketing plans, because it feels, it feels like something that could become, um, a spark could light a big fire. And, it sounds like based on the information and opinion that you have shared like so far, one way or another, regardless what the outcome of the election like will be, there will be a very significant need for kind of crisis communication that you mentioned like earlier um, when it comes to this corporate yeah. communication professionals, like they're going to have like some role like to play and then every leader is going to kind of like we'll have to have this crisis communication awareness at least right like turned on and to understand like what is going on especially what i'm understanding from like uh, based from your input especially for the younger like slice of the um population or i, I would say like workforce in the workspace i think um both for the younger portion of the workforce. Also, I think um, it still is relevant to think about the the Blue Island sort of red ocean uh, gaps that we've seen for a long time. So the disparities behind, between hyper urban settings and very rural settings. Um, my overall suggestion, and I don't want to be an alarmist, right? This is um, just because you see you see people being more activated just because you see tension does not mean that there's necessarily going to be a flare up. I think where businesses um, can invest some time is in thinking about their stakeholders. So looking at looking at the different people who influence different portions of your business. And I, I don't even think that this has to be like a crazy exercise with a with a consultant, right? I think if you put your HR person and your marketing person, your sales person and someone, you know, from your ops team and you said, "Hey, like let's talk through the different groups of people that have that have an influence on our business." Um and you look for places where there may be um some conflicts, right? So you know, as you parse out your stakeholders, your employees are one, your management level is another, um, say, uh, the, if you have any active, um, nonprofit groups who s regularly engage with you, that might be another, um, your customers are clearly one. Um, if you see some tensions in there where taking an action that might, might, uh, 
be favorable in from the perspective of your employees, but might um, not be favorable from the perspective of your of your customers. Those are areas that you want to flag and you want to think through um, who should be weighing in on that type of conflict. It's better to do it now and it's better to do it when like you as a management team are in a cool, calm, collected um, headspace than after, for example, you've discovered that you're trending on Twitter. And a lot of great takeaways like from here for business leaders. Uh, what I'm understanding, like the main highlights for me are like uh, mapping out the stakeholder structure, including uh, your clients, right? And maybe even if you are sourcing like from, I will bring another dimension like to this discussion, maybe even like international, like if you're sourcing uh, from like Southeast Asia, China, let's say, or like if you actually have an office over there. And I think in this stakeholder mapping like effort, you kind of have to include them too, right? Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, there is, um, so, so when we think about sort of the like federal system and um, what we've seen a lot of effective monetary policy um, that has helped stabilize um, some some of the turbulence um, in in our economic system. What we haven't seen a lot of over the last say ten or fifteen years is robust fiscal policy to address some of the supply side um, issues. Uh, so I'll, I'll just say like there's been a, we've received the benefits, like sort of the head uh, tailwinds from globalization for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, we have received, um, and, and so if we think about supply chains, we've seen costs come down um, as we've benefited from some of, some specialization uh, across uh, internationally. Those, some of those tailwinds have become headwinds as we're looking at different parts of the world um, where we've seen disruption from wars, from conflicts. And so, yes, that that really needs to be a part of the consciousness. Um, and I think that in the business world, um, you know, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see a lot of it. Because we're we're looking at having a fairly divided Congress, I don't think that we're going to see a lot of um, real in-depth fiscal policy uh, addressing those things. So recognizing where there may be weaknesses and integrating that into your thinking um, specific to your business is going to be very important. And here's the beauty, or maybe how, how can I say... Um... I will say here's the beauty of, of this like distinction between federal and then uh, local level like politics, I will say. Um, it sounds like maybe the system is kind of designed like to not have like this full alignment to address some of the uh, issues. I don't know if this is like an outsider perspective. But one other thing is federal elections like really brings it all together. And because we are talking about like an economy that is incredibly internationally integrated, like and global, especially for business like leaders, the federal elections importance is actually uh, becomes, I will say, higher than the local level elections and election cycles. But I'm curious to hear about like your opinion on this distinction, right? Like federal and local um, level elections and some words on, on, on local level politics and its relation to, to business, like from your perspective and what are similarities and differences uh, between these two based on the sure. things that you have talked so far? Sure. So I think that, that um, as we look at, um, it is, you know, it has certainly become a, um, a, an environment where it's more difficult or it takes longer to pass legislation through uh, Congress that is um, pretty universally accepted. In that space, we've seen states step in and be more willing um, to to take 
on aggressive policy. Um, an example would be um, California. There was recently a bill that was passed out of the California uh, legislature that would have held AI companies responsible for, say, catastrophic uh, interruptions to to our economic or social system. So, for example, if you built AI that took down the electric grid, you could have some financial responsibility for that. That ended up being uh, vetoed by uh, Governor Newsom, but it does show a it does show a local um, government willingness to be involved in in what we generally think of as sort of national policy. And that tends to be a function of the fact that, you know, local legislators are looking around and saying, eh, I'm not really sure that I'm going to see this happen at the congressional level. So it, it is worth your, you know, I think it's worth business leaders um, while to be aware that, that even if you, if you're, um, even if the the laws and the policies that typically impact your uh, your industry have been managed at a federal level, that there is there is an environment now where it is certainly um, time well spent to be paying attention to what is happening at the state and local levels. I'm curious whether it's possible for you to generate a seven second, like one liner advice for, for business leaders. <laughs> seven seconds. All right. We're experiencing an age of disruption. And if you can be informed, it can be an opportunity. And if you are flat footed, it can hurt. Do something. <laughs> or like think, think, uh, think about like the, um, so I, I, so let's put it this way. Um, anytime there's change or disruption, if you're, if, if you're caught sort of looking at your world through the same narrow lens that you always have, um, the chances that you find that disruption to be negative are, is far higher if you can take a broader perspective, there is a, an enormous amount of opportunity to meet your customers, your market, and your um, employees in a place that matters and address their concerns from a um, place of authenticity and be ready to capture the, the upside of, the, of that disruption. Yeah. A great one-liner. I would say a great message. <laughs> I don't and think that was seven seconds. <laughs> no, it's okay. It could be more than seven seconds, but uh, it, it's a very deep, uh, deep message to to deliver. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. It is such a fantastic opportunity, like for me, honestly, to talk with people like you from this network. And I will say, what a great mind that is focused on like topics, like very unique topics that the vast majority of the business leaders are not really even like thinking. I mean, feeling, but not really thinking intellectually. So I really think that there are a lot of takeaways from this conversation for business leader, uh, leaders. And this, we have been really generating a very deep like content so far, and I think it's going to take some time to digest like for our listeners. But I, I truly appreciate like your time. It's been, it may, I, I couldn't understand like how this like time actually has passed, right? And <laughs> I, I hope um, we stay in touch, and maybe we will have another like session together. And this has been a fantastic conversation like so far, uh, Julia. Thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. I, I really appreciate it. And, and I'll say, if I can say one thing in closing, um, Absolutely. although this is a subject that um, I think a lot of people in the business world have not been, uh, they haven't been trained to think about it um, in the same way that we are trained to contemplate or, you know, say marketing or finance or operations. It really isn't 
a particularly scary space, it is very manageable. Um, and so I, I encourage everyone to view it from, from that um, optimistic point of view, because in it, you will find opportunities to grow and expand and um, deliver better product. Julia Ellis, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. This has been a wonderful uh, conversation so far. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for diving deep with us on another episode of Lehigh Low Ego High Impact Mindset. Join us every week as we discover the stories, strategies, and insights that will empower you to grow personally and professionally. Stay inspired and catch you in the next one.